Welcome to Flex Perspectives, where I interview the thought leaders, innovators, and executives shaping the future of flexible work. Flex Perspectives is brought to you by the Flex Index, the world's most robust source for full-time, hybrid, and remote work requirements. The Flex Index represents more than 6,500 companies, 30,000 office locations, and 100 million people. It's a great place to start if you're looking for your next flexible work career opportunity. Today, my guests are Kevin Delaney and Marcella Dukali. Kevin is the co-founder of Charter, a future of work media and research company. He was previously co-founder of Quartz and a senior executive at the New York Times. Masella is head of workplace strategy and innovation at Charter. Today, we'll dive into a critically important topic, AI, and the role of the HR executive in figuring out AI for the organization. We'll talk about how to reduce anxiety within your employee base, determine which types of tasks can be automated versus augmented, and tips and tricks for HR execs to lead effectively through the AI transition. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating that helps new listeners find the podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Flex Perspectives podcast. I'm Rob Sadow, CEO and co-founder at Scoop. Today, we have Kevin Delaney and Masella Dukali on the podcast. Kevin is the co-founder of Charter, a future of work media and research company. Prior to Charter, Kevin was a senior editor at the New York Times and co-founder of Quartz. Masella is the head of workplace strategy and innovation at Charter and previously a director at Life Labs Learning. Kevin and Masella, welcome. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for having. Well, it's so nice to have you both. Kevin, maybe first question for you. You've been a senior leader at some of the most important publications in media. Uh, what led you to want to start Charter in the first place? Yeah, so I, I found myself, as you said, like in leadership roles of organizations, including the Wall Street Journal and Quartz, and just couldn't find great uh, information sources that helped me lead teams and organizations in coherence with where I thought the world was going around questions of sustainability, reinventing capitalism, human work amid AI, diversity and inclusion, and multiple generations in the workforce. And the the text and the, the, the conventional wisdom around management I found was actually pretty dated and didn't speak enough to the, the, the potential of management and workplaces to be vectors of change for uh, for individuals in them and actually for society more broadly. And so that led to the creation of Charter as a place where we bridge research to practice for people who are owners of the talent agenda, for people who are workers or managers or leaders in our organizations, including people who are specifically in human resources or people roles, but we try and equip them with what research shows, what are reporting about their peer shows are in terms of best practices to equip them to, to uh, navigate a lot of the changes around work, including flexible working, inclusion, and work in AI in ways that, uh, in ways that are, that make for more fair and dynamic workplaces. Got it. And when did Charter get started? And tell me a little bit about the progress so far, the audience. What does that look like? Yeah, so Charter started, you know, the summer of 2020, as a lot of things start as an email newsletter. And then we just kept getting traction, 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 and then launched uh, formally in the summer of uh, 2021. And uh, we built this uh, media business. So we have a bunch of free newsletters, including now one on uh, with independent reviews of technology that people use in the workplace. And a lot of that is generative AI tools that's called Charter Work Tech. That's a free newsletter. We have our flagship newsletter. And then we've had a lot of companies that have come to us and said, hey, you're, you're studying the research to answer these questions. Could you support us through workshops, training, advisory support, and original research on these questions? And so we've launched Charter Pro, which is a business where we work directly with companies to support them in these ways. You know, we have a readership of um, significant readership of our newsletters, and it is, you know, it is people in a, in lots of executive roles and management roles um, who are engaged with some of the some of the um, issues that I mentioned earlier. And Masala, you took the plunge, if I recall correctly, to join Charter. I think in early 2023. Is that right? Um, yeah. I would say that's the official official date, but um, I had the very wonderful privilege of getting to work with Kevin and Aaron at the sort of beginning of Charter becoming what it is today. And I think at that time, or not, I think at that time it was called Reset Work. So you can see the evolution. Um, but I would say that one of the things that was really exciting about coming to Charter full time and just in general was the fact that my career has been grounded in 
better workplaces. Um, you know, I've worked at Warby Parker and Squarespace, like really, really tiny inception before they are the things that they are today. And it always dawned on me that like, wow, like work doesn't have to suck. Like they had really sort of human first um, policies and culture. And I really thought it was powerful to take that experience and what I did at Life Labs to come to a place that was really focused on making the workplace better for everyone in a vast range of industries. I love that. And I love the mission driven kind of orientation and the, oh, it seems like a personal calling in it. I think that's so powerful when you're building companies. Um, yeah. We're going to spend some time on today. Um, speaking of kind of uh, building companies and, and new ways of thinking about building um, is AI. And I know it's a topic that uh, you both in Charter spent a lot of time thinking about. I doubt that there are many executives at any company uh, that have not spent time thinking about it. I found the report you guys put out recently called, I believe it was the AI mandate for HR uh, to be really fascinating. So tell me, you know, why do you believe that HR um, is, is kind of a, a necessary owner of this topic? Or why is AI something that should really be on the HR executive's agenda? Yeah. So Rob, one thing that I'd say that it is very important is that the role of an HR leader and just the HR function in general has become much more strategic than it has been historically. And often when we think about what that strategy has looked like in recent years, we're thinking about things like return to office. We're thinking about perks and benefits, considering that employees have, you know, just broader needs or demands or desires than they have had in the past. And in fact, I think that you know, in, organizations have had to really rise to the occasion, I think, especially as we sort of look at the public sector and see that they're maybe not exactly offering the things that people need. And so people are looking at their workplaces and saying, do more for me, do better for me. And HR leaders are responsible for really driving that change. And instead of just seeing it as just a benefit to the company, we really have to consider how uh, this is going to drive business outcomes. AI is going to impact business outcomes. And so we can't just leave it to our CEOs and our CTOs to drive the mission. We have to think about how it works well with people, how we can get the most out of people and the technology, and how we're going to think about making sure that we're not scared of what's going to happen to us, but that we feel a little bit more in control of the results that are to come. So, I would, Rob, so I would just add to that, like the, the job of the HR leader is to maximize the talent within an organization. And I think what's become clear is that with AI, there, there are almost two different paths that you can take. One is you can see it as an opportunity to cut costs so you can replace workers with robots or, or the software equivalent of robots. Or you can see this as something that actually makes people better in their jobs or at the very least allows them to spend more time on higher quality things. And our belief is that people leaders are the ones who can actually see that opportunity most clearly. Whereas other members of the C-suite, you think about the CFO there, you know, their mandate often is to cut costs. And if the people leader is, doesn't have a strategic role in the conversation about AI, the consequences, you know, are, are less optimal for the company, because we know that AI works better when it when people and technology are working together. And for individuals in society, I would say, because they bring the perspective of, of valuing talent as opposed to trying to replace it with technology. You know, it strikes me, Kevin and Masal, as you talk about this, that the role of the HR executive, this is almost like the second punch, if you will, in terms of a one-two and what's evolved that role. If I think back to 2019 in a world where most of us were working in the office, at least most days of the week, to first the shift to go home for uh, policy or public health reasons, and then the movement toward flexible work and spending time in the office and out, and now AI and how that re-envisions the role of, of HR and also just how, how many people do their work within a company. It, it, does it seem like to you that HR maybe has undergone more change or the role of that executive has changed more than maybe any other over the last you know half a dozen years or so? I'd say so. I think not only has the role changed, but I think like even when you look at many roles across the sphere of time, the skills needed for to be successful in the role has evolved. And I think that that's what's happening here. Not only is are, are the targets becoming a little bit different, but now you need different skill sets. And one of them is being able to really work well with your other stakeholders 
and also to help bring them along from the sort of antiquated thinking that they might have about how the role should function. So it's not only for the business, it's for your stakeholders. And of course, it's for the fact that our world is changing very rapidly. I would say the the third area, Rob, too, that you mentioned uh, remote working and AI. And I would say that diversity and inclusion is obviously not a new area, but in the wake of George Floyd's murder and other focus on that area, that's another area where uh, people leaders have an important role in strategy and execution and C-level and board level attention for sure. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, Are there HR execs that you feel like, or maybe companies that you think are doing a really good job staying at the forefront on these particular topics, especially in AI? I feel like it's always helpful to have a person or some organization that you can point to as you know, someone who's who's really getting the the understanding of why this is so important for the HR leader's role. For me, when when you say like thinking about it the right way, I'm always hesitant to name anyone because um, the right way, like we don't know what is the right way right now. But what I think I can say is about thoughtfulness. Like there are companies who I think are being really thoughtful about how they're navigating AI both internally and also what they're putting out into the world. So as an example, uh, I would name Thomson Reuters, who's actually one of our members uh, at Charter. And one of the things that I really commend about how they're approaching AI is in a collaborative uh, and employee sort of centered notion, which is what Kevin brought up. Like we know that this technology is better when people are involved. It's not about automating and getting rid of them. So recently, I think it was probably back in May, Thomson Reuters actually had like an AI learning day. They stopped everything in the company. People actually got to come together, learn together, try things out. And that's really powerful. Not only does it lower the guard for employees so that they feel a little less hesitant, like, oh my gosh, is it over for me? What's going to happen? I know that companies are saving a ton of money, but also like, how can I be involved in making this better for myself? Where does it free time and space? And what can I actually solve versus what's a fun thing that ChatGPT can do for me? I mean, it's fun to explore ChatGPT, but we want to talk about real implications for progress, which is what I think companies are really looking for. And it seems like what you're talking about too, Ms. Ella, that's so important, if I understand correctly from the Thompson Warriors example, is also just raising the water level across an organization in terms of the relative understanding or capability. I know to give a personal example at Scoop, one thing that we did a number of months ago to try and get everyone at the company more familiar with this technology or kind of like the the evolution of technology and AI uh, was just a company-wide hackathon where basically for a week, whether it was related to our product or not, just wanted everybody to go immerse themselves in it. What interesting things could come out of it? What are the different pieces of technology? Just so it shapes the way that you think about building in the future and you understand what's possible. So it makes a lot of sense in that regard. You know, the, the how, how do you help people kind of like all collectively, you know, get smarter and more familiar with this topic? Absolutely. I would say that the, yeah, and I would say that the, the kind of workers on throughout your organization are the ones who know the business problems that they're wrestling with and are best positioned to think about how AI can be used to, to better address them. And what's really exciting about generative AI, I think for a lot of us is that it's accessible to pretty much anyone. You don't need to have a technical background. You don't need to be a coder. You don't need to be an engineer to actually uh, be able to use these tools in your everyday work and experiment with them. And so, you know, our, our advice for organizations is to involve a diversity of people in your organization as much as possible, provide training and access to these generative AI tools so that people are able to imagine how they could actually use them in their workplace. The thing that you run into is what are the guardrails that you want to establish? And, you know, that's something that we also, we also advise organizations to take their breath and, and quickly, but, but thoughtfully establish a philosophy and some explicit guardrails for how people should be using these, uh, these tools. You know, the people very quickly, when you start talking about the tools in business context, they very quickly go to a few um, cautionary examples. One of them is Samsung, where some of their workers put confidential information into 
one of the generative AI tools. Um, and then that information wound up actually becoming publicly visible as a result of that. You don't want that to happen. There's the example of the lawyer that the New York Times and others have written about who, who asked ChatGPT to write a legal brief for him. Um, and it got a lot of the facts wrong. You don't want um, people doing that. And so those, what I'm seeing is that organizations are, are reluctant to, um, to engage with the technology because of that, but actually they're very simple ways to avoid the problems that, uh, that we've seen in those cases. And, and that's kind of what we're advising people, both be explicit about the rules for using them and also take 10 minutes and actually think about the tools and the context in which people are using them to avoid what are pretty straightforward problems to avoid. It seems like a really difficult problem uh, in, in a few different ways. And, and, and I'm curious what your perspective is. On the one hand, as an HR executive, it sounds like the, the feeling generally is, look, we, we want our employees to get more familiar with this technology because we believe it's important. We believe it can be an accelerant in a number of different ways. And so there's a piece of it, which is a mandate to go forth and experiment and play a little bit so that the collective learning level of the organization grows. On the other hand, there's a, but be really careful what you do with them and what information you put in, because as part of that learning, you expose some confidential information or something else um, that can be very risky to the business. And then there's a third piece, which is as you evolve that policy to try and find that middle, this underlying technology around AI is evolving so rapidly, right? It looks different now than it did three months ago, It'll look different six months from now than it does today. And so how do you keep that policy current and not either hinder your employees from experimenting or playing with things that they need to, or kind of go too far and as a result, put yourself at risk. And so how are you finding that uh, HR leaders are balancing some of those things or how do you advise HR leaders to think about kind of like finding the middle, so to speak on some of those topics? I'd say for starters, it really is about sort of understanding initially, understanding and also defining how you want to approach the utilization of AI in your workplace. If it starts as sort of like a, hey, it's a free for all, see what happens. You're more likely, of course, to run into the dangers that you're talking about, which is people maybe putting information in there that's not going to be um, confidential or, or whatever it might be. And so I think we want to define up front, hey, we want to experiment, but here are the boundaries that we're experimenting with and also let people know that this is rapidly changing, which means that there has got to be sort of an institutionalized way of being or taking in knowledge about AI on a regular basis. And you have to define those resources both for yourself and for your organization. So as an example, you know, let's say you're using a, a tool like uh, Claude, which is Anthropic's tool. Claude 2 was recently launched, if you didn't know that. And for what it's worth, I would say Claude is um, maybe safer than what their, their whole goal is to make sure that AI is ethical. Um, and so, but, but if you weren't aware that Claude 2 was arrived, you would feel way less, you'd feel like very overwhelmed about the fact that, oh my gosh, they could put anything in there. What's going to happen to it if I don't understand how this works? So it is about scaling up and it's about also really kind of admitting that I don't, know all the things, but we're learning together. Here are some trusted resources that we can all have handy. If I learn something, I'll share it. If you learn something, you can share it. And it is about keeping it and letting people know that they've got to stay nimble about what the boundaries look like. It's not going to be anything that's set in stone to your point. And there, and for larger organizations, there are tools and, and services that they can use that actually are, that protect things like confidentiality and safety. And so you know, a bunch of the organizations that we've spoken with have been using effectively versions of open AI that are behind a walled garden. So it means that uh, there's no risk of leakage of internal confidential information outside of those platforms. But you need to be an enterprise customer of Microsoft to, to approach it in that specific way. But there are enough companies that are, and so they can actually put these walls up around their organization's usage of these tools to uh, to ensure safety and then let people actually experiment pretty freely from there. Masal, you said something a moment ago that I found really fascinating, which is this, this relationship or communication style between HR or the company and employees, which is, look, we don't know the answer. 
We're going to figure this out together and kind of iterate through it. And part of the reason I find that really fascinating is that answer feels like a very similar answer to how some of the best companies that approach flexible work approached it, right? Which is, we don't know the answer on exactly how much time should be in the office or out or how to get these practices to be exactly right, but we're going to learn and iterate together. Um, and it's the it's the first time I had thought about that same kind of leadership style or communication style is applicable in, in multiple kind of instances. I'm curious, is that a, do you think that's almost like an emerging best practice for how to lead on some of these kind of more nebulous topics? And And is it different than a kind of like a relic of management a number of years ago where companies like, look, I'm just going to assert the policy and it is what it is and, and kind of employees, you know, fall in line versus the, hey, we're going to have to learn and grow together to figure this out, especially in spaces mm-hmm. that are not, not so well defined. Yeah. I love that you're asking this question because I think it it gets to the root of everything that we are experiencing right now, whether it is workplace flexibility, AI, I mean, think about anything in your life. When we go back to the core and we look at psychology and we look at human beings, people want collaboration and people want autonomy. And so if I'm telling you, you must do it this way or it has to be this particular way, yeah, that works to a point and then it doesn't when they decide that they don't really care anymore or that it's actually, you know, the consequence isn't that scary. And so just like any other sort of change management framework, the same thing is happening here. Except truly, we don't really know what's going to happen. We have ideas. People talk about it. By the time we're done with this call, there'll be 15 more articles out about all the things that are happening that are good or bad. And so I think when you bring employees into the fold and you say, let's do this together, there's a greater trust in what the outcome is going to be because people have their own vested interest and they're like, okay, I need to be heard. They trust, you know, to Kevin's point, I know how this work needs to get done. And my opinion, my voice is being valued. And so I just think like we will get more out of people if we take this approach going forward with everything that we do. But I think especially when things particularly feel unknown, scary, or perhaps like they're evolving very rapidly. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's so interesting, especially in the context of what you talked about with fear, right? And there's been a number of studies I've seen come out, I'm sure you're familiar as well, about uh, employee fear as it relates to AI and you know, some excitement, oh, yeah. but also concern about what does it mean for their jobs. You, you, and your, I think in the report that we discussed, put out uh, or at least referenced a framework that I found uh, really thought provoking was that, which is this idea of augmentation versus automation, and what does it mean to think about, uh, as Kevin described, the robots coming for your job or what jobs that you know their, their software, your software overlords could do versus what does it mean to augment people in the way that they operate? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what that means to you and, and how can HR leaders apply some of that thinking maybe to both dispel some of the fear or anxiety in the organization and also create clarity on how, how to use AI most effectively within an organization? So all the researchers studying the impact on jobs pretty much estimate that there will be a net increase of jobs as a result of the implementation, implementation of AI in the workplace, generative AI over time. And the reasoning is basically that the the AI is able to improve productivity, economic growth, and that this will translate into a greater number of jobs. They acknowledge that some of these jobs will be different and that is part of the their optimism because there'll be new roles that are relate to AI that, that, that don't really currently exist or don't exist in the same quantity. But quietly, they all acknowledge that in the shorter term, there's a risk of real disruption and dislocation. And what this means is that people will lose their jobs and they will struggle to actually find new jobs. And and we know, you know, if you think about your your friends or colleagues or family, we know just how uh, challenging that can be and how problematic it can be for families, for organizations, for society more broadly. And so one way that at Charter, the way that we're thinking about this moment is to say, there it's not inevitable that people lose their jobs because of AI. This is a choice that companies can make. And we've seen some organizations, including IBM and BT and others, signal that they are gonna make that choice. They're gonna either 
lay off people or hire fewer people for roles because they um, because they can use the AI instead. But we actually think that there's a there's a moment where organizations can make the choice to say we're going to use this technology and retain our commitment to individuals and workers, knowing that over time, um, the the most the best thing for us, for our companies, for individuals, and for society, is that humans and technology work together. And so, the distinction that you mentioned is the one between automation and augmentation. And automation basically means that you're taking tasks, you're giving them to AI, and you're taking them away from people. And in in many instances, you're uh, replacing people fully with um, with the with the technology. Augmentation is the idea that you are giving people, you know, the equivalent of a ladder or a cherry picker or something to do their job better and reach uh, new areas, do higher quality uh, work than they would without this tool. Um, and so some, you know, one example of that is um, we've spoken with Morgan Stanley and they're using an AI tool that basically uh, is tapped into hundreds of thousands of research and in other internal documents. And it allows their financial advisors to quickly answer clients' questions um, by by accessing this kind of knowledge source in a, in a way that much more sophisticated way than they've ever been able to do that. And the idea is that then those financial advisors can spend more time with their clients advising them on how they feel about retirement and what their strategy is and what their overall investment approach should be and so forth. And so what augmentation looks like is you take some of the kind of lower skill, lower um, the job, the parts of the uh, of the job that are more admin heavy, more um, less sophisticated. Or routine or road or yeah, things like that. Yeah. And ship people to the places where humans can really add value. And so our, you know, strong recommendation is organizations take this framework as they go in. And in some cases, it will involve training for people to be able to work more effectively with the tools, rethinking uh, where people are in their organization and roles. But like, that's why we're here. And uh, and uh, there is that opportunity is very, very real. And so is there a is there a process that you recommend that companies or HR leaders go through to you know communicate the idea of you know, look we're more focused on augmentation than automation so to speak how do they figure out what roles or types of jobs or or or, or efforts are are better disposed or predisposed toward automation versus augmentation then how do you communicate that or train employees like I'm curious Curious, almost what the roadmap looks like. You, you bring a you bring an organization on to help them think through step by step uh, how, to, so how might, to kind of approach this. Yeah, I might quickly answer and then turn it over to yeah. you. But I would say that this is a classic change management uh, problem, and you know, organizations have forever been dealing with change management, particularly around technology. And the the overall framework that you could take for this is. Imagine what the end state is. What do you want your organization and your workforce to look like in some future state? And then step back and think about the policies, the communication, the culture, the systems, the tools that actually will allow to get you there. And you can do that even if you don't know exactly what the path looks like or exactly, exactly what the end state will be. And to your, to your point, Rob, the communication about how you're planning to navigate this is one of the essential parts of uh, change management saying saying out loud you know what your philosophy is what your approach is and then Ms. Ella, over over to you yeah so plus one to everything that Kevin has just mentioned I think another um, way to think about all of this again is experimentation there's never going to be a particular thing or tasks that you say, that's it, this is what we're you know, automating and this is the thing that we're augmenting. This is why you want to also do this collaboratively because you wanna make sure that people who actually do the job and do the work can really speak to the advantages or the disadvantages of that experience. So one of the ways that I would assess that experimentation would be checking in on a few different things. One of them is like, 
is this, you know, we've been talking about this, is this particular task particularly admin heavy? So, you know, documentation, scheduling, record keeping. I'm not saying that these are not important tasks because for what it's worth, we all know we've got Uber and Instacart and everything that automates it makes our lives easier. But when something goes wrong, I don't want to talk to a machine. I want to talk to a human. Help me. And it's about really understanding, okay, what part of that should go to the human and what part maybe can we allow artificial intelligence to navigate? Is it something that's time consuming? And then of course, if it is, then where can my time be spent more effectively, more efficiently? How am I amplifying human expertise or knowledge? If I went to a beautiful five-star restaurant and suddenly there is, um, you know, a human robot taking my order, it's like not exactly what I'm paying for. Yes, it's the food, but I want the experience. And so we have to kind of really ground ourselves in understanding where does the average human in this role really excel? And to, to Kevin's point, if it's not about the average human, how, like, what do I want this to look like? And so we're going to have to look at every sort of function and dispel, like, what is the best case scenario and who is actually going to do this well? And again, like, that needs to be something that happens together. Um, the last thing I would say is just you really want to assess risk. And when I say risk, I don't mean that, you know, you have to pick, like, the least scary tasks to do this with. But I mean, like, start with things that are not going to yield negative consequences. So if you automate, again... Um, every single customer service order that you have, it's not to say that it could go wrong, but let's say maybe you're a company that's starting out and you haven't assessed what actually works for your customer base and something does go wrong. That can be a very big consequence because, because people say, I, I don't want to work with these people anymore. So a few different things, risk, where humans actually are going to do the very best thing and actually use their knowledge to the best of their ability, how much time is actually being saved and for the time that is saved, where will it be used instead? And then also thinking about, you know, just the rote tasks that are happening and if they are tasks that actually deserve human attention or if it can be done elsewhere. So, so we covered a lot of ground on AI, right? A number of different things that HR executives need to be thinking about and different approaches. I imagine just like in the adoption of any technology, there are some folks, as you mentioned, who are out in front, but the bulk of HR leaders, the bulk of companies are probably still either in wait and see or haven't really taken a definitive step yet. And so what I'd love to do for a few minutes, just talk tactically about if, if, if you're trying to take your first step in the right direction, you know, what are the things that you would recommend day one that someone do or think about? And maybe three months in, 90 days in, you know, if you're trying to evaluate whether the first things you've done are successful or what are the kind of the milestones you hope to hit you know, what should an HR leader be thinking about and feeling like they're at least embarking on this journey in the right way? Yeah. I'd say the very first step is, and we write this in the briefing that, you know, we can share with your audience. It's increasing your organization's AI aptitude. Find your trusted resources for people to get engaged with. I think what's really dangerous is when everybody's getting all of their information from different places. And then we come in and expect everybody to kind of uh, play by the same rules. It's not to say that you can't be learning different things, but I think you want to sort of set the groundwork. One, we believe that AI can be a really powerful tool internally. Here's where we're gathering our information. We encourage you to explore this as well. And then from there, you're going to want to start thinking about what your philosophy is around philosophy around AI actually is, like what those policies look like. Help people have guardrails here's what we are going to do with AI. Here's what we won't do with AI. If you don't have those things in place, it becomes really messy. And again, you might want to say, these things will maybe change in three months. They might change in six months, but let's start here. And then we'll check back in and see, is this working? Is it useful before we go any further? After you know that initial sort of stage, I think when you look three months in, you want to really think about structured experimentation. So the initial experimentation looks more like we played with, you know, ChatGPT. We created a deck. We tried something around image or sound, and that's really wonderful. But the thing is, again, we want to think about the value that this brings to our organization, not just the fun that it brings. And so you want to start getting very strategic. And that means, again, looking at maybe a particular group or task force within your organization and saying, it would be ideal if we could cut down 
the amount of time that we spend doing XYZ. Let's use, you know, whatever tool, whatever chatbot to see if we can make that happen. And it's a test. But again, you're actually testing it towards something that would help you decide, is this something that we actually want to invest energy, time, resources into uh, implementing on a larger scale? I love that. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, what are some of the best resources out there that you're seeing in terms of if you're an HR leader and you're trying to learn more about this topic or you want to go learn more about different types of chatbots or other AI functionality, where are you suggesting folks go uh, go to learn more? So we're, we're writing a lot of this, humbly I would offer, we're writing a lot about this and doing a lot of this research at Charter and our site is, you know, is charterworks.com. We have free newsletters, both at one where we're, grappling with this, but also our work tech newsletter, where we're actually doing independent reviews of the tools that people are using. And so that, that I think is a, you know, resource that is meant to serve uh, people, you know, very directly. There are a few places that I turn also for uh, information. One is an email newsletter called Inside AI, and it's a little bit kind of inside the tech bubble, but it's close enough to the edge of the tech bubble that it's actually pretty useful for just monitoring the various kind of um, macro things. And a person who, you know, we've been following really closely is a Wharton professor, uh, Ethan Mollick, who started by using generative AI tools in the university context, but actually is doing work in his Substack uh, newsletter that is very relevant to workplaces more broadly. So those are some of the uh, some of the uh, people. We're also um, watching closely the work being done out of Stanford's um, AI and human, human AI center, uh, people like um, Eric Brynjolfsson's kind of research, which, which is important articulation of this automation versus augmentation of philosophy. I have to just really emphasize um, Ethan Mollick's work, his Substack. It's so good. And, you know, I think right now, especially when there's such like a, you know, this is a zeitgeist topic and everywhere you go, people are talking about it. And sometimes it feels like salesy and like just overwhelming. And what do I do with it? But I think he really does a great job making sense of it. And I think, you know, to Kevin's point, just thinking about um, finding resources, whether that's Ethan Malik or some of what they're doing at Stanford, I'm really fascinated by how actually people are talking about this in universities, simply because this is our next generation. They're coming into the workforce. And so you can imagine if a professor is, you know, has has a section on AI in a syllabus and how to use it or how not to use it, workplaces need to be thinking about the same because those people are going to be coming in. And so we really want to get very familiar with how people are developing their skills um, as early as we possibly can. It's great to have some good recommendations because I think I see about a hundred chat GPT, yeah. uh, one sheet, cheat sheet on LinkedIn posted on a daily basis. And uh, I think a little bit of curation there is uh, is a nice thing to have. Totally. Uh, so maybe one final thought on this topic. Um, is there anything else related to AI and HR? I mean, I know it's a huge topic, but any kind of like final thoughts or, or, or things that you feel like are important to touch on that we haven't touched on? A final thought that I would add um, just is a very shameless plug for a campaign that we started here at Charter, and it is hashtag she powers AI. One of the things that I found in doing research um, was that, you know, the field is quite, it's, it's not very much filled with women at all. And it's really frustrating because when you think also about HR as a field, it's predominantly women. And it's just so important that we are all, everyone, women, minorities, men, that we're all part of the creation. Like what we do now is going to impact what AI becomes in our world, in our workplaces, with our friends and our family, our children, et cetera. And I just encourage women to um, become aware of AI. I know, again, it's like very drowning. And again, like you said, if we all had like a penny for every time we saw like a free guide on ChatGPT on LinkedIn, like vacation forever. But it's it's really important that we kind of think about what not only learn what AI is, ways that it can help us and continue to be part of the conversation, even if it's just listening to somebody that you trust about it so that we can get, you know, involved. I think I think women need to be very much part of this movement right now. And I would I would 
say just to add to that, that pe- people like everyone should engage with this. And I think, you know, one of our concerns is, is, is what Ms. Hella just said, which is that there, there not be a gender divide um, in terms of who's engaging with this technology and is brought along with it. We know that underrepresented groups are often left behind in moments of technological change. So among the work that we're doing, including a bunch of orig- original research is around how AI can be used in ways that are compatible with worker voice and inclusion, you know, which is really important and best practices are starting to, to coalesce there. But I would also say that that applies kind of generally to people. Like there, it would be easy to, um, to outsource your thinking about this to, you know, to a working group or to the CTO or the CFO or someone else in your organization. And the truth is that everyone really should be involved, both to make sure that it's not treated as a purely financial exercise, you know, as we've talked about, um, and also to make sure that it is exer, you know, it's it's applied to business problems as opposed to just being a kind of abstract technology that that the organization is using because it feels like it has to use, but it's not really equipping it for for, you know, the years to come. So um, it's a really important moment now and and the contours of it are, are admittedly still blurry, but engagement right now is really critical. Those are both great points and really important ones to, to end this, this part of the AI discussion on. Um, I think as you both know, and we've talked about every time we always end our episodes with an opportunity for uh, listeners just to get to know you both personally a little bit more and what makes you tick. And so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll throw out a few rapid fire questions to each of you, just quick answers, just so people can get to know you great. better. Does that sound yeah, okay? that's great. Sounds great. All right, cool. So what was your first job? I worked at the limited two, which was like a <laughs> a clothing store for for like tween aged girls. <laughs> I had a lawn mowing business in my uh, in Queens growing up. Awesome. Uh, what is the what is the best book you've read lately? The best lately, I'd say um, I really enjoyed the Creative Act by Rick Rubin. I would say um, the book I've been thinking about a lot and referring people to is Chip Wars by Chris Miller. It's about the kind of global semiconductor um, uh, context. And I also recommend a very short novel called uh, Small Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan, which is a pretty heavy topic, but beautifully written. Chip Wars seems like a pretty relevant one, especially related to AI in this Definitely. current moment. Um, so in meetings, uh, are you typically video conference with your video on or video off? On. On. On, on, on. The research tells us on. <laughs> I, tif- I typically do on too. Uh, a show or movie that you are obsessed with right now? I don't. Okay. So I, Kevin knows this about me. I watch a lot of really lowbrow TV. Um, it's good for the mind, but... I will keep it highbrow for today, but I'm rewatching Mad Men. I love Mad Men. I just think it's one of the best series ever. A classic. I, a family watch right now is the British TV series Endeavor, which is this kind of mystery <laughs> uh, series set at Oxford, which is really, really good. Awesome. My next on my agenda is I watch a lot of lowbrow science fiction type stuff. So <laughs> The Witcher is next for me on the, the most That's recent great. season. So I gotta get there. <laughs> love that. Uh, when you're in the office, uh, favorite snack? Hmm. I haven't been like in an office actively in a long time. Um, so I'm going to go back to like my days at Squarespace. We had like a in-house chef. There was like matcha and chicken wings and there was a Shake Shack next door. So it's probably better for my health that I don't have those things. But those were some of my favorites. My go-to office consumption is coffee. Coffee, coffee, more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you you and me both. I feel like the the in-house chef Shake Shack almost feels like a relic of like a different era, you know, yeah. in such a funny way. Um, all right. Uh, favorite piece of software, either related to future of work or AI? Hmm. Okay. I mean, I said this before. Maybe I've... I- Kevin Kevin maybe knows this about me. I was just talking to one of our other teammates, Jacob, about this. I just love Claude too. It's just, I just, I find it so smart. I find it enjoyable to talk to you. I love that it asks me my feedback when I'm asking it questions. It's just, yeah, it's won my heart over. 
I would say in terms of, um, I'm, I'm still a chat GPT person, but I'm giving uh, Claude more time. Uh, thanks to, uh, thanks to Masella. The, like, the truth is the office software that's been most defining for me, important for me in my recent business uh, life has been Slack. Um, and I kind of grew up in in-person physical offices. And then um, in in one of my previous roles at Quartz, we were able to create a global startup because of what Slack enabled. And that remains a really powerful tool that, you know, be really difficult for us to to work without. Totally. We're, we're a Slack organization too. I totally get it. And the way you talk about AI is hysterical. It's almost like a, a complicated relationships or lovers triangle. I'm, I'm with ChatGPT, but I'm exploring Claude and I'm not quite sure. So it's too funny. Um, one future of work thinker or writer that you really respect? Hmm. Um, they're the VP of people and she works at Athena. Her name is Melly Narano. Um, I just think her, her posts on LinkedIn are very thoughtful and just like in the personal conversations I've had with her, they seem really grounded. And I say that because, you know, the HR world, especially on LinkedIn these days, it's just like, everybody's got a thought. Everybody's got an opinion. And sometimes it feels like they're just selling opinions and it's annoying and hers never feel that way. And so I'm just, I can appreciate like the groundedness and like really wanting to make the workplace better, which again, goes back to why I care about any of this in the first place. I'm going to give you three, which is probably too many, but two people at Stanford, Eric Brynjolfsson, who has done this great work on AI and augmentation of workers. Nick Bloom, I think has done a lot of the important work that's around um, hybrid work research over the last few years. And there's a, a European political scientist named Isabel Ferreras uh, whose work on corporate governance, I think, is super interesting. And her uh, exploration of different models for how workers could have a greater voice in the lead in leadership of organizations is something that I think is really relevant to a lot of the discussions that people are having. Awesome. All right. One last question uh, for listeners who want to learn more about each of you personally or read more of what you're working on. Uh, where should they go? Charterworks.com for the general, but just because so much of what we will, um, so much of what we're interested in is like being published there. But LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a really great place to hear about podcasts that we've been on or things that we're writing or just things that we're thinking about work or responding to that's happening in the world right now. So that's Masella Dukely on LinkedIn. And I would say Charter, also charterworks.com. We have tons of free resources available, including several free newsletters um, that people find really useful. We have high engagement with and, and think that uh, people will be interested. In. We also have a partnership with Time Magazine and you can see you know, our by bylines in places like Time and the New York Times and Fortune. Uh, but if you go to time.com slash charter, you can also see our coverage there in the time context. Awesome. Uh, Kevin, Masella, this is such a fantastic conversation. It's so important right now. And I think it's a topic that I imagine is top of mind for not just HR executives, but virtually any executive and, and probably most non-executives as well. And so thank you so much for imparting your insight and for the great research that you put out at Charter on a regular basis. Thanks for having us, Rob. Yeah, thank you so much, Rob. It's a great conversation. My pleasure. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Please also consider giving us a rating or leaving a review as that helps other listeners find the podcast. For more Flex Index content, including past episodes, our Flex Index newsletter, and monthly research reports, visit flex.scoopforwork.com. See you next time.